Coming up on Twyat, we've got Google's new fiber, a new Wi-Fi array, and cloud services delivered to you. Twyat on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the following show is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyat. This week in Enterprise Tech, recorded July 23rd, 2012. Not a Roomba. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. This is the show dedicated to IT professionals, enterprise execs, and those geeks who just want to know how the world around them is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasare, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by a great panel today, starting with Mr. Brian Chi from the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory. Brian, say hello. Hello. I'm with the University of Hawaii School of Ocean, Earth Sciences and Technology, and we own the planes, the ships, and submarines at the uni university. Fantastic. And also, I've got Curtis Franklin, who is an editor over at Enterprise Efficiency. Curtis, where are you today? Padre, I am sitting in beautiful Naples, Florida today, enjoying the tropical sunshine and the thrill of <coughs> enterprise technology. Uh, tropical sunshine, I, th I think you mean uh, oppressive humidity, but I'll let that slide because we're going on to our third guest, who is actually our guest presenter, Mr. Oliver Rist uh, from InfoWorld. Oliver? Tell us, where are you from and uh, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm in Kirkland, Washington today, and I've been a technology journalist for the past, uh, I don't know, 15 years, which means I'm in psychiatric care. But today I'm having a rare lucid moment, and you get to take advantage of it. Well, we thank you for your lucid moment. We thank you for taking whatever meds you are taking to give us all the information we need about the enterprise. Now, speaking of the enterprise, there is one story that I, I want to cover really quickly because it's, it's kind of short. It's actually a non-story because we've heard it before, and that is that Google has made a non-announcement. They sent out a, a little bits of viral blasting through text messages, through Google+, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, announcing the July 26th announcement. And uh, if you actually go to the uh, the announcement page, all it says is keep watching here. But everyone knows what it is, right? It's it's the rollout of Google Fiber in Kansas. Uh, have have the three of you heard of this? Yes, I'm uh, very jealous. <laughs> absolutely heard of it. We were one of the communities that uh, bid on becoming a Google community, and we're uh, very sorry to see it go somewhere else. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that I thought was an enterprising angle to this was uh, it, this might be a nice time to talk about the fact that there's a little dirty secret in telco, and that is most of the big carriers, the ones that we associate with owning the Internet, you know, Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, <laughs> they actually own tiny chunks of, of fiber. I mean, when you talk about the United States itself, uh, th there's a system of interconnects where you could, if you're sending a packet from San Francisco to New York, literally go through a dozen or more different providers to get that packet there and back. <clears throat> Someone mentioned to me that Google was interesting because even though they're not a telco, they own quite possibly more fiber in the ground than, say, even Verizon. Have you heard about this, Brian? Well, fiber in the ground is a really interesting thing. You know, in the old days, it would have been someone like Williams or something where they were using railroad right-of-ways to drop fiber in the ground. Um, Google has been very quiet about their acquisitions. And realistically, I'm not sure how much they have because they're not saying. Yeah, no, nobody says. I mean, that's one of the, uh, the, the things that's so difficult. I remember at one point we were having an argument at, at Interop about who owns what. And uh, one of the guys pulled out a map that he had been working on for over a year to show which companies owned which runs and which individual strands or even which timeshares in individual, individual strands that were licensed and rented and leased to different <clears throat> companies. But uh, no one wants to say, look, we own 20% of the fiber in the ground or we own 100% of our runs between data centers. We do know that Google did a huge acquisition in the early 2000s to buy up a lot of dark fiber, but we don't really know much more other than that. Uh, Curtis, have you heard anything in Florida on the other side of the country? Well, not so much about Google specifically, but one of the interesting things about this is that we refer to a lot of 
the uh, the fiber, the backbone fiber as the tubes, as the pipelines for the internet. And the situation with Google and the other telcos is very similar to the situation with the pipelines that carry crude oil and other petroleum products. You know, Shell and Texaco, companies like that, they own very little of the pipeline that carries their product from one end of the country to the other. Those are owned by a vast array of companies, some of them owning as little as one foot of a pipeline. We've got the same sort of situation in fiber, and the amazing thing really is the chain of billing that occurs to make sure that everyone gets paid for the transmission of bits over the little bit of fiber that they own. Right. I like that analogy to uh, oil pipelines because it's with all the peering arrangements, it's supposed to be one network can drop their packet into the network, it will pop out the other side. And, uh, well, that's all they need to know. They, need, they don't actually have to worry about the individual peering arrangements every time they transmit a piece of data. Uh, Oliver, I, I know you've covered a little bit of, of this in your work with, uh, with InfoWorld. Uh, what do you know about the state of fiber in the United States? Uh, my experience would go back to providing uh, fiber to large uh, real estate companies in New York who would, quote, unquote, light up a building. Uh, my experience there is Verizon owns pretty much the entire town, no matter who you use. Uh, so from the end user perspective, billing is pretty easy, but uh, you get to see why Verizon charges so much uh, if they have uh, to pay all these other providers uh, underground. Yeah, it's, it's just I find that so interesting because typically when we think of the Internet, uh, most of us think, well, I get my Internet through Comcast or through Cox or through AT&T. And uh, all that peering happens in the background, but as enterprise professionals, that's just something that we find interesting. We, we want to know where the packets are going. And if Google actually comes in as a new player and really does light their fiber and really does a great job with Kansas City, the, the sky's the limit for what this could do to the industry. Hey, Padre. One of the interesting things is I got a chance to um, attend a presentation by an ex-AT&T cable designer. Uh, how much those undersea cables cost is actually a very closely held secret, but it is in the billions. Um, she alluded that the link that goes from Alaska to the northern islands of Japan cost NTT something on the order of $10 billion. And there's actually only four ships in the world um, privately held that can actually lay those kind of fi fibers and those kind of links. Two are owned by AT&T, one by NTT out of Japan, and the others by Alcatel in France. So it's a very rarefied market. That would actually, I think, make for an, a fascinating episode of Twide in the Future. I know, I know, Brian, you've actually been on some of those cable ships that have the huge spools that just pay them out of the back as, as they cross the oceans. Uh, and, and even more interesting is what they have to do anytime they get a break. And they basically have to uh, play a huge game of that the crane thing where they just reach down and try to snag the cable, bringing it up and re-splice it. But you have these ships just going back and forth, constantly dropping fiber onto the ocean floor. Uh, and again, it's something that happens in the background. Not so interesting to the regular user, fascinating to the enterprise. But okay, that's enough about Google's fiber because they really didn't say that much. And until they say more, I don't want to give them any more press than they deserve. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Now, Brian, do you know what I'm holding here? It's a Frisbee. <laughs> or a Roomba. Yes, yes. Yeah. High-tech Frisbee, no. high-tech Roomba. Uh, both of us have had experience with this. You want to tell the, the group what this is exactly? Well, it's actually a Wi-Fi array. Now, what makes this really interesting is that it's got multiple radios pointing in different directions, and it's both frequency and power agile. So some of the radios can be used for sensors, some of the radios can be used for actual transmission, but it has the ability to change its RF envelope. So meaning if you have a lot of users off in one direction, let's put more power in that direction than say um, the other. <laughs> and uh, it's one of the few that are on the market that are capable of handling ultra high density. In fact, uh, last year at Interop, the uh, Xerus people did a demonstration with 1,000 iPads all running off a single array, all running video, and it was wonderful. Um, was that so, 1,000? Because by the end of the show, I heard it was about 800. I don't know. You know, it's, uh, the keynote worked well, and people were happy, but 
I got a sneaky hunch that people were trying to snag iPads as the demo was going on. They snagged the iPad. I actually snagged this. I think I was, <laughs> I was much smarter for that. That leads us into our, uh, our pre-recorded segment. This is Pro Gear. I'm here at the NOC, the Network Operations Center for Interop Las Vegas 2012 at the Mandalay Bay. Now, a few weeks back, I got a chance to be on Forecast with Tom Merritt, and, uh, well, I was discussing Spectrum, specifically the efficient use of Spectrum, how in an increasingly RF-crowded world, we need to use the Spectrum that we have more efficiently, better, so we can get faster, more devices, and, uh, well, all around just connect stuff. This flying saucer Cylon looking thing is actually a, a wireless array and uh, it's not a huge Roomba it's not yeah this is not a Roomba <laughs> this will not clean up your house but what it will do is allow you to have a really efficient use of your Wi-Fi if you look inside here and I'm not sure if you can get the shot this is actually about 36 different radios clustered around a core so that it divides the 360 degrees into multiple slices. This particular array is from a company called Xeris that I, I, I've worked with uh, in the enterprise space. And um, instead of shouting in a room to try to get the attention of devices, it uses lower power with much more directional reach in order to get just that device, which means you could take the same piece of spectrum and divide it into multiple pieces. Now, the array that I used on the show was this, a Xerus XN8. It's a very simple concept, but it's elegantly designed. Rather than having a single AP, a single access point, blasting out energy in 360 degrees and hoping that some of it gets back from the, uh, the receiving unit, it takes the 360 degrees and divides it into four, eight, 12, 16, or 24 slices using a specially designed reflector. Now, the cool thing about something like this is that I can take the existing allocation of spectrum in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz range, and I can have multiple radios within the same ray, uh, array that are using the same frequencies without interfering with one another. It's an incredibly efficient use of spectrum, but this has been replaced with this. This is Xeris's new XR series of arrays. Obviously, it's smaller. But the same idea holds. It takes the 360 degrees and it divides it into multiple slices. It just does it in a more elegant way. Now this used, I won't say off the shelf, but uh, almost off the shelf components. A power PC processor with memory and a operating system that was stored on a flash card. This has been built from the ground up to be an array and it shows. Now, the biggest design change has to be the fact that this was PowerPC and this is MIPS, which means that Xerus has the ability to grow the array as needed by the customer. And that starts with this. The radios are now contained on these cards. It's the same card that you would put into your laptop using the same bus, which means that I can buy the array with two radios, four radios, and then grow it as my needs grow. It's a fantastic way to start with a low investment in the technology and then continue to use that investment as you grow and your needs change. Not only that, using this interchangeable system means that I can remove six screws and by myself upgrade my array. 802.11a, 802.11b, G, N, A, C, whatever it might be, in the future you can use the same equipment, just change out the radios and uh, the, the pattern of the beam shaper. Now, this is technology that we will see more and more in the coming years. There are more vendors that are trying to copy it because they realize we cannot go down the path that we are going down right now, and that is just more APs with more power. At some point, we need to get smart, we need to get faster, we need to get more efficient. That's where Xerus comes into play. Now, if you want to find out more about these arrays, you've got to come to Interop. Go to the Xerus booth, talk to their engineers, or come to the NOC. Find me, find one of our engineers, and we'll be happy to show you what Xerus has in store for the future of your Wi-Fi. Brian, I, I remember the first time that we used Xerus arrays. It was for the uh, Interop show in, the, in New York at the Javits Center. And it was one of these things where they, they were a new company for us. We didn't really know who they were. They came in at the last minute and they said, yeah, I think our arrays could help you keep your wireless up throughout the conference. Because at that point, our experience had been every wireless system just dies when you get into high densities like you have in a convention hall. 
So we installed these, uh, I believe four of them, whereas the previous year we had installed uh, 110 APs. And it stayed up the entire time. And it just amazed me. Because yes, this, this is a really efficient use of spectrum. Uh, you can actually get a, a shot of this and see the innards of, uh, of the, this is the actual array that will go into the brick house. This will be giving Twit a crazy good Wi-Fi. Uh, have you had any experience with the, uh, the, the new series of Wi-Fi arrays, Brian? They just plain work. So say, for instance, if you've got um, in a building, you're sticking an array into a corner for some reason, you don't have to buy extra radios that are going to be blasting out past the boundaries of your building. So it makes it a lot more economical because that's one of the big things that a lot of people complain about, that the uh, Xerus arrays are expensive. But they are actually very economical in that, you know, like when we first did that uh, Wi-Fi interop, the comment from the lead engineer was, we've never run more wire for wireless. Uh, <laughs> and that's one of the big problems. A lot of people have to run uh, wire plus power or a lot of PoE injectors and so forth. A traditional AP really only has the ability to handle maybe 20, maybe if it's a real high-end enterprise, maybe 30 people. But at, once it hits 30 radios, it just tips over. We've had that happen to us time and time again. So traditional APs, people put in a lot of them. Xerus, we can run relatively few and have very high density crowds. Curtis, Oliver, what kind of coverage have you given to Xerus? I mean, it should be something that's in the background that you that it should be ubiquitous wireless, but have you had a chance to play or experience what Wi-Fi is like off of one of these arrays? No, well, <laughs> but I wish I did. <laughs> I have had a chance to experience Wi-Fi off the arrays, both at Interop and at other conferences. You know, it's interesting as a, a working journalist, one of the things that I look for when I go to a large gathering like a conference is serious, reliable Wi-Fi. And I find that when I go to a show, I sort of look up and if I see these flying saucers on stands around the show floor, I feel much better about uh, being able to file my stories in a timely fashion. So that's a really good thing, I think, for Xerus and the companies that deploy them. Yeah. One of the things that uh, one of the Xerus guys mentioned to me is they always have a problem with sticker shock. I mean, when you're looking at between four grand and 25 grand for a single array, depending on how advanced and how many radios you want into it, people say, there's no way I'm gonna pay that much for an AP. But what they don't realize is that one AP, that one array is replacing 10, 20, 40, 100 different individually run APs. And you gotta work in, how much are you paying for, uh, for labor? How much are you paying to run individual APs? And then the, the fact that most enterprise APs run you between 500 and $800 each, it doesn't end up being that much. But we've got an, a Xerus engineer coming on the show it, not too long. He was supposed to be in uh, episode three. Unfortunately, he blew out his leg, and so we're going to have to push him back. But he's going to explain all the technologies that go into making an array like this and how to properly deploy it. Now, that was a pro gear episode. But we've got some progy here at the Brick House as well. Anyone who has visited us, visited us knows that we use a new tech TriCaster for all of our streams. It's what allows us to mix together up to 24 different inputs. All the cameras that we have around the studio can be shuffled back into a central control board and then put out in a format that we need. We can put professional looking titles, we can stream it out to mobile devices, out to the web, make it look like a professional TV show or make it look like a professional internet show. Now, one of the things that I love about the TriCaster is that uh, they offer several different versions. They've got everything from what you would use if you were just starting up in IPTV to equipment that could fill out a full-blown, full-cost TV studio. We love TriCaster. We love new tech because they support the show, but I also like it because I like gear. I like technology, and I like things that just work. If you are looking for a way to, uh, well, establish yourself in IPTV, I urge you, check out the TriCaster. Go to newtech.com, see what they might be able to do, and uh, visit the Twit Brickhouse so you can see how we use TriCaster to bring you the best of the best on the internet. Now, we're going into our case study, and that means that we're going to be throwing it over to Mr. Oliver Rist. Oliver, we're talking cloud services. I think the first thing that has to happen is you need to define for us exactly what are cloud services. So there'd be two ways of defining cloud service. Uh, one, if you're the customer, it's someone 
providing an application to you or a service that's managed as a cloud on the back end. Uh, that's very analogous to some of the things you just went over. For example, the uh, the Sirius access point and Kurt looking uh, for a good Wi-Fi point at various shows. I go to shows. I don't particularly care what they're running for Wi-Fi. I just want to get it. Uh, I just recently interviewed Zynga, who's a technically, I guess, 100% a cloud service provider. But if I'm playing Farmville, I don't particularly care how they're managing it. They just did a great morph from all Amazon to half Amazon and eucalyptus, and that's fascinating for the back end. But all I want to do is sell virtual onions. So if my farm goes down, I'm upset. Um, the other way to define cloud services is uh, from the enterprise side is to use that whole new cloud stack and move off of just infrastructure as a service and up to the application layer. And that's where things get really interesting. And they're also bleeding edge at this point. Speaking of that uh, that service layer, you just had an article about OpenStack. And uh, it, well, it opened my eyes as to the state of uh, virtual services and internet delivered services. You want to talk a little bit about your conclusions from that article? Well, OpenStack specifically, I mean, if you're going to come up with the four or five of the big cloud stack names, right? You have on the commercial side, VMware and Microsoft and Citrix. You might throw an IBM, HP and uh, Oracle, but they're, they're more black box, right? Actual stacks that you can analyze would be those first three. And then there's, uh, I think, three big open source players. So there's uh, OpenStack, there's Eucalyptus, and there's CloudStack. So Evaluating these different stacks depends on your needs. It depends on when you want to deploy. It depends on how you want to deploy. So from my OpenStack article, uh, I learned that OpenStack is a, has a great mission. Uh, they're probably going to be a, a fascinating player, at least from, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but they're, uh, you can't even say ragged edge. They're still in development, right? There's a bare stack and then a good 60 70% of the stuff that the commercial stacks are already answering OpenStack is really just building at this point. Now, when we're speaking about OpenStack, I, I know that, uh, Brian, you've, you've actually been playing with it a little bit. And I know that, Curtis, you've been covering uh, some of the move into cloud services. What are the things that, say, an, an IT manager needs to consider when moving services out of his colo, out of his data closet, out of his premise, and up into the Internet? Brian, you want to take that first? Well, yeah, sure. <clears throat> One of the big issues that I always, you know, coming from a security background is regulatory issues. You know, if you're Sarbanes Oxley, HIPAA, FISMA, and so forth, uh, making sure that you have the ability to actually still continue to do the auditing and meet your regulatory um, requirements. That's always one thing that you need to take a good hard look at. Also, I tell people that, you know, if you're going to be, say, starting off by putting things into, say, like Colo, Make sure everything's debugged well before you stick it in someone else's racks because you have to pay for all those after-hour access in order to go and restart something, you know, uh, fix something, move, move equipment around. Uh, but when you start getting into true cloud services, is take a really hard look at your architecture. How are you laying out your V switches? How are you laying out the links to your various um, pieces? And are you combining enough or are you separating enough? Um, when you start buying all these virtual machines, every machine uses resources and resources cost you money. And it doesn't pay to go in half-baked. You have to do a lot of planning beforehand and make sure that you know what you want to achieve instead of just, oh, let's just try this. Because um, that'll probably break the bank. That, that's actually a very interesting point because one of the things that I've run into is you get managers, you get execs who perhaps don't know the technology fully, but they hear that everyone's moving into the cloud. And so naturally they're going to ask their IT people, why aren't we in the cloud? Not really knowing what that means. And then they get surprised when moving services, critical, mission critical services into the cloud, get you things like downtime and uh, documents that are not synchronized or unavailable. Curtis, you had a very good point in last week's episode when we were talking about VDI, and that was it all depends on your connection. Do you believe you will be connected at all times? Because that determines if VDI makes sense. That determines if cloud services make sense. Uh, you you want to follow up on that? 
Well, I think the connection is absolutely critical, as you say. And the other thing that is critical in any move to the cloud is the SLA, the service level agreement. That's the contract in which you're going to specify precisely what services you're getting, what that means both to you and to the service provider, the level of quality, the level of reliability that you're willing to pay for, and very importantly, precisely what that provider will do to compensate you or to correct the problem if that service level isn't met. So instead of spending all of your time worrying with your employees about how they're going to make things happen, a lot rides on that SLA. So the contracts people are critical and being able to define exactly what you mean when you refer to a particular service is critical. So the SLA, three little letters that mean pretty much everything when it comes to living and working in the cloud from an enterprise point of view. Oliver, I know you identified a lot of frustrations in your OpenStack article. What were the frustrations beyond just connectivity, just beyond having a proper SLA with actually setting up cloud services? Uh, well, setting up cloud services is a development project, right? The, the the point of running an application in the cloud is you can build an end-tier app. So part of your application might be in the public cloud, part of it might be hosted, and part of it might be in on your private cloud. To Brian's point, that helps with regulatory issues. If you're protecting customer data, you want to keep it behind the firewall. Uh, if for some reason you need extra scalability for the logic side, that might be in a, in a hosted private cloud. And then if you want uh, serious scalability for a web application on the front end, that might be in a public cloud. Um, so far, we've been defining applications as SaaS versus something you build. Uh, one of the nice things is you can actually see, at least one case, how an, uh, an application optimized for the cloud is going to evolve. Now, uh, I'm actually... Uh, I've worked with uh, Microsoft as a, as a contractor, so I can't really uh, talk about this too, too deeply, but uh, they just released the beta of Office 365. And Padre, actually, you might talk about that uh, interview that I did with you. The new beta of Office 365, if you go check it out, um, actually tries to meld behind the firewall deployment with cloud deployment, meaning you can run both for single instance of the application, server and client, and then mix and match where you're going to run each piece. You can actually deploy parts of the suite uh, on your user's desktops and have them run the rest of the suite off of, uh, off of the cloud. And you can change that as, as you go. You can watch it where performance might hurt. Maybe it makes sense to pull it back or performance isn't so great. Maybe it makes sense to push it out. There's also licensing differences uh, to consider. And obviously to Kurt's point, the SLA at that point can become really complicated, uh, but it's neat to see how this, uh, the idea of a straight web application or a straight behind the firewall application, that is going to morph. Uh, Microsoft, I think as far as I know, you two can correct me, as far as I know, that's the first one that I'm watching that's really evolving, but no way are they going to be the only one. I think uh, everyone's uh, uh, moving to that point because the development parts of the stack that people are building, VMware, Citrix, uh, OpenStack especially, all these new dev tools, that's what they're designed to do. And that's going to be really interesting for enterprise people uh, to follow. I actually love the fact that you brought in the new Office suite. Mary Jo Foley talked a little bit about, about Office 2013 last week. And um, one of the things, of course, is that it's so tightly integrated with SkyDrive. They want you to have access to your documents. And actually, they want you to have access to your office, your suite, no matter where you are, no matter what platform you're on. They, they, they want to make it easy, agnostic, for you to be able to access your data through their suite. My question would be, is that sort of the entry point? Is that how they convince everyone to move over to, say, their Azure platform, so that all my services, not just my, my storage and my word processing and my spreadsheet are coming from cloud services, but I actually start thinking about moving my enterprise? Or, or do you think we could go to something like Office 2013 and it still wouldn't really push towards migrating vital, crucial network services into the cloud? Open question. Well, it's got to start someplace. Anybody? Go ahead, Brian. Well, I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's got to start someplace. Um, Kurt and I wrote a book in chapter 10. The last chapter was all about futures. And one of the things I started bringing up was things that 
people like Arthur C. Clarke and um, some of the science fiction writers have all talked about is that someday in the future, it'd be great to be able to go and say, I want to buy a chess game. I want to use it for 10 minutes or I want to do accounts payable, but I want to be able to shop around for who's going to give me the best deal. I, this is starting already. to come back to the old, um, um, the, um, Oh, geez. Uh, service bureaus, the old service bureaus and mainframe day. Because realistically, clouds are very much like the old mainframe, except it brings all the best of the PC world into the mainframe. Clouds are taking that further and creating this abstraction layer so that the, I don't have to care what's under there. I just want my apps. And that's really the bottom line. I want to be able to do my task without having to worry about what's underneath it. And Office 365 starts getting us this start, this little teaser. Um, where is my computing? What is it? I don't care anymore. And I think that's going to be the bottom line to clouds in general. I, I wanted to throw it to Oliver, but it looks like Microsoft heard him talking about his contracting days, and so they shut down his Skype connection. So instead, I'm going to throw it over to Curtis. Curtis, what do you think? I mean, uh, give me your impression of where this is heading in the next five years. Well, I think over the next five years, we're certainly going to see things moving in the direction of increasing interconnectedness and a real agnosticism, if the priest will forgive the term, about precisely which platform we're using. Now, it's important to note that with both Office 2013 and Microsoft Azure, Microsoft is trying to play both sides of this because while on the one side, you do have the move towards openness. On Azure, you have the move in the direction of a cloud architecture. On 2013, you do have the ability to get at files from a web-based interface. In both cases, they really do depend on having the Microsoft foundation beneath them. And in the case of 2013, it really works much better on a Microsoft client operating system. So Microsoft is trying to play it in both directions. I think you're going to see a lot of that kind of thing in the next, oh, two to three years. Moving out a little bit for, farther than that, though, you're going to begin to see more and more companies deciding that they can build a business on a piece of this and that the total pie is enough larger if they're truly open that they're willing to do that rather than trying to own the entire cloud experience for a company. Yeah, I think that's vital for the cloud experience uh, for, for it to succeed. Now, I, I want to give the last word to our guest who uh, brought this topic to us. Oliver, you're back now. We were joking about Microsoft, but of course, we love Microsoft yeah. and Microsoft loves us. So tell me, <laughs> if I'm a IT professional, if I'm a grunt, or if I'm an exec, what do you think are the, the top three things I need to know before I start migrating services into the cloud? Well, number one, you are a grunt. But, <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess from an executive level, it's about licensing. Uh, the cloud picture, whether you're deploying a SaaS-based uh, service or whether you're building your own, um, as to Brian's point, yes, you got to plan it carefully. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, but from the other side, from the SaaS side, it changes licensing uh, significantly. So especially in something like uh, Office 365 and Office 2013, um, looking at licensing and different ways that those two platforms uh, uh, are sold, even if they do interact with each other, that from the exact level is going to be a big, uh, a big selling point. From the grunt point, from the from the architect point, I guess the uh, the Office 365 type experience is more about deployment. You have new deployment options, and that whole middleware piece. Uh, yes, as long as using Microsoft and I guess Windows Azure uh, and, and, and those platforms, you don't really have to worry uh, that much about that, that logic in the middle, that, that bridging logic. But then if you are building your own end-tier application, no matter which stack you're using, uh, yes, that is going to be, to me, uh, I think the largest uh, problem for most companies, right? Virtualization, we understand. Uh, you have to do a broad-scale virtualization project to really get a private cloud running. Uh, but that piece, that hybrid cloud piece, that's just coming into the world and running applications across that and managing those applications and monitoring performance. Um, that's all uh, currently something of a black art, and it's going to evolve over time. Well, we've done it again. We have run out of time on uh, Twiat. We had a great panel, and we just really scratched the surface. We're going to have to bring these topics back because 
Well, I mean, cloud isn't going away. VDI isn't going away. Uh, the idea of licensing software or licensing the desktop experience isn't going away. And so the three of you will have to be part of the Twyad experience for quite some time. Before we go, I do want to say go to the Twyad show page at www.twit.tv forward slash Twyad and you'll be able to subscribe to the show. Subscribe to whatever feed makes sense to you. If you want to listen to it in your car, download the audio podcast. If you want to watch it in HD, in a romantic moment with your loved one in front of your 50-inch plasma, download the high-definition stream. Or if you just want to watch it there, go ahead and click the play button and, and see Quiet Twiet in all its glory. Also, if you don't mind, we do need help with filling out the Twiet Reddit page and the Twiet Wiki page. Go to the bottom of the show page and you'll be able to find links for how you can help fill in information about guests, topics, and if you go to our Reddit feed, you'll even be able to suggest topics for future episodes of Twyet. Also, you can submit topics for uh, next episodes, for future episodes, by going to my Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash Padre SJ. And of course, I want to thank my host. So, uh, Brian, what are you working on? What do you want to plug? Well... I'm actually having a lot of fun with this. It's a thin client. You showed off the end computing. This one is a, just a box, but it's a Citrix HDX and also Remote FX. It's the only one on the market. And uh, it's going to come in a one and a two um, video, video monitor uh, version. Cool toy, cool toy. And, uh, well, I won't call it a toy because it's a, a tool for enterprise. Uh, Curtis, what about you? What's going on? Well, we certainly hope that people will come and join us in the IT community at enterpriseefficiency.com. Great place to be. Also want to take a moment to give a shout out to Mark Weiser. Today would have been his 60th birthday. He was chief technologist at Xerox Park and coined the phrase and the concept ubiquitous computing, which has to be considered the foundation of the cloud computing that we have been talking about today. As I said, today would have been his 60th birthday. He died far too young, and we all owe him a debt when we use the cloud. And Oliver, what are you working on? What do you want our viewers to know about? Currently, I'm working on, I believe, three different product reviews for InfoWorld. I'm hoping there'll be a fourth that covers the reliability issues between Windows and Skype. Um, <laughs> I go to infoworld.com, uh, click on my, uh, my, or, or search for, for my name, and you'll see all the, all the latest stuff. I look forward to your reviews, especially the reliability of Skype. Uh, we've, we've had issues here, but again, Microsoft loves us because we love them. Now, don't forget, this Friday is System Administration Appreciation Day. So if you have a sysadmin, if he's that poor guy with pale skin sitting in the basement who has hygiene problems, take him out, air him out, take him to a movie, take him to Dark Knight Falls or Rises or whatever that, that movie is. I, I don't watch movies. I, I, I stay tuned to the Twitch stream. But take him out and uh, show your appreciation for all the ways that he connects you to the Internet. I'm Father Robert. This has been Twyet. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just stay Twyet.